Hi YouTube, welcome to a, another Explain by Example video. Now today's topic is going to be on Object Oriented Programming or OOP. I was taught the concept of Object Oriented Programming really poorly when I was at university. One thing that I never really understood was why is Object Oriented Programming important? My code works, why do I have to change it to morph it into this object-oriented programming design? The answer is quite simple. Reusability, simplicity, and security. I thought it was because programmers wanted to be fancy, which in some ways is true. So rather than telling you what object-oriented programming is, I'm going to start with the why because I think it provides a much more convincing argument as to why we should write code in an object-oriented programming design. So, why write code in an object-oriented programming design? I mentioned reusability just before. So let's look at a simple flower example at why reusability is important. People often ask me how I make my drawings. And I'm going to be honest, I use a more advanced version of paint called Microsoft Whiteboard. And this is usually the design process. I'll start by building my flower up component by component. Why build my flower up in this component by component way? Well, this allows me to reuse components. Let's imagine I wanted to build a different color flower. I simply have to change the color properties of a few of the components and reuse the rest to build a different colored flower. So reusability is key. What is another? I mentioned simplicity as well. By breaking it down into components, I can maintain components of my flower without impacting the other components. Imagine if I had stuck this flower to my school exercise book. Now, if I had wanted another copy of my flower, I would have to cut it out of my exercise book, which if anyone has ever tried to be crafty before would know, cutting out is a lot more difficult than building up. The same logic applies to software code. You can cut and copy code snippets, but it is often messy, takes more time, and you may end up with duplicates that are often difficult to customize or modify. So imagine instead of cutting and copying, you could build your code up component by component and customize it as you go. You may end up with a completely new software while reusing a lot of work that either you or someone else has done in the past. That is sort of the idea behind object-oriented programming. Treat everything like objects, what I have been calling so far as components, and write program in the way where these objects can interact and build on top of one another like using Lego to build houses and cities. First, you define these objects using templates, call a class, a class is like a blueprint for your objects. When you want to create an object, you take that class template which outlines everything you need to build that object and you simply say, go create this object for me. Every time we instantiate a fancy word for create a single instance of a flower object through the flower class template, we have a flower object that gets built with a set amount of petals, leaf, stem, and the ability to make our flower either happy or sad. For example, our flower class might look something like this. Now, the petals, leaf, stem, and emotion are what we called attributes in object-oriented programming. You can think of it like default values. You can change these default values using methods, which I'll talk about in a second, but let's discuss why attributes are important. Attributes allows us to define what our flower object is going to look like. If I said, go make a flower to you, you'll probably ask me what kind of flower, how many petals, what color, how big do you want it? But if I gave you a flower class with some attributes, that saves both you and me some Q&A time. Hence, object-oriented programming encourages code simplicity. You also mentioned methods. What are they? What if you didn't like the default values I gave you in the flower class attributes? Let's say you wanted a flower with more leaves and less petals. How would you change that? This is where methods, which I often call class functions, comes in. 
methods allows you to modify the functionality or behavior of the class objects you instantiate. So if you want to change the emotion of your flower object, you can call upon the happy method or the sad method. How would these happy and sad methods work? This is where I'm going to introduce one of the first principles of object-oriented programming known as abstraction. Abstraction was possibly one of my favorite phrases to hear when I was at university. And that was when the professor would tell us, you don't need to know this for the exam. That was something I always noted down. Abstraction in object-oriented programming is the same. Abstraction tells us, hey, you don't need to know how this method is implemented behind the scenes. All you need to know is that if you call this method, you should get back what it is promised to do. In this case, if we call the happy method, we can make our flower object happy. If we call the sad method, we make our flower object sad. Now, so far, our flower class doesn't allow us to modify the number of petals, leaf, or stem. So let's add a few more methods to our class to allow us to do that. We'll add a set petals method. This allows us to encapsulate our attributes. Wait, encapsulate? Encapsulation is another principle in object-oriented programming. Sometimes we might want to keep certain information private. For example, we might want to allow the number of petals for our flower object to be updated, but we don't want to expose that information to anyone. This flower example may not be the best use case here, so let's think of a different example. When I was at university, I worked as a TA or teaching assistant, which meant I had to mark assignments and exams. Now, for those of you who have ever been misfortunate enough to have to mark piles of assignments and exams, you would know the pains of what is this illegible handwriting trying to say? And should I give an extra mark to the student? Assignments and exams need to be cross-marked to try and mitigate biases like these. Now, if we were to write some software code to allow our teaching assistants to submit their marking and feedback into a system, this is where we need to think of encapsulation. One requirement of the system is we want to allow our teaching assistants to submit their feedback but not view other teaching assistants feedback because that way our students will get a fair evaluation and score. We might declare a private attribute score and feedback and only allow these to be updated through the update score and update feedback methods from within the class. There are no methods that allows the teaching assistants to access other teaching assistants scores and feedback that could cloud their judgment and feedback evaluation. You've just learned why encapsulation is important. Sometimes we want to keep certain pieces of information private within our class and only allow access to things that can be public. This is a principle that supports how object-oriented programming encourages security in co-design. I'm no florist, but even I know that there are different types of flowers, such as sunflower, daisies, orchids, lilies, poppies, and so much more. So, in this case, our flower class is a bit too generic to create any specific type of flower, which is why I'm going to introduce the third principle in object-oriented programming known as inheritance to overcome this issue. Inheritance allows us to define a parent-child relationship between classes. This means you can extend the flower class, which is a superclass, and create a subtype of flower, which is a subclass. Why inheritance? Inheritance allows for code reusability. For example, daisies also have petals, stem, and leaf, much like other generic flowers. So rather than redefining all of those attributes and methods, in the daisy class, we can inherit all of those attributes and methods from the flower class. On top of that, there are also specific characteristics to daisies. For example, they are generally small, 
They have a lot of petals. They are generally white in nature, etc., etc. We can specify all of these specifics within the daisy class itself. Another important concept to note here is that you can override methods from a subclass or overload methods within the same class. This is touching on the last principle of object-oriented programming, which is known as polymorphism. For the longest time, I never really understood the difference between inheritance and polymorphism. But to boil it down to the basics, inheritance allows you to create shared characteristics and behaviors. Polymorphism allows you to change or modify the shared characteristics and behaviors. We learned that we can create a daisy subclass to represent a more specific type of flower class. And our daisy class inherits all the traits that is defined in our flower class but what if there are some traits we want to change for instance in our flower class example earlier we said there would be a set petals method that allows you to determine the number of petals in a flower object what if a standard flower only has five petals but a daisy class has 20 petals in this case we can override the set petals method in our flower class with a set petals method in the daisy class. That way, when we instantiate the daisy object and call set petals, we will have the number of petals set to 20 instead of five. The other way that polymorphism works is to overload methods within the same class. For example, we can create different types of flowers within the flower class by overloading some of the methods inside the flower class. You might be wondering, because I sure did, why would you polymorph with one approach over the other? Why overloading? Overloading is known as compile time polymorphism. Basically, that means the compiler figures out which method to use at compile time. Let's say you had three methods in the calculator class. These methods allow us to sum up some numbers together. The first sum method takes in two parameters, x and y, which are both of integer type. The return value is also an integer type. So if we call something like calculator.sum22, we get four back. The second sum method takes in two parameters again, x and y. However, this time they are both double type. The return value is also double type. The third sum method takes in two parameters once again, x and y, but this time it is one integer type and one double type. The result value is returned as a double type. Overloading is a great demonstration of simplicity. We have simplified our class methods to use the same name, sum, that can accept different types and often times different amounts of parameters. At compile time, depending on which argument types are passed through the method, Methods, the compiler determines if it will execute some methods one, two, or three. Why overriding? Overriding is also known as runtime polymorphism. Remember the concept of inheritance we talked about earlier? The whole parent-child relationship thing with classes? Most parents know that not everything they tell their children will be agreed upon by their children. The same goes for superclass and subclasses in object-oriented programming. The subclass child may not necessarily agree with everything in the superclass, the parent class. In this case, they have the ability to override certain methods while reusing all the other methods they do agree upon. This time we can add more sum methods by extending the calculator class with another class called math. The math class would inherit all of the methods defined in the calculator class and override the sum method with its own implementation. Perhaps we want our math calculator to be able to create a lot more complex things like a mathematical equation. So if we called math.sum 2 plus plus two plus zero, we get four back as a result. You made it. You just learned about objects, classes, attributes, methods, abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. And most importantly, I hope you understand the why behind coding in object-oriented programming design. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. Remember that you can follow my blog at medium.com forward slash at michelle.z. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment if you enjoyed this video.